2. Miss Stein instructs. When we came back to Paris, it was clear and cold and lovely. The city had accommodated itself to winter. There was good wood for sale at the wood and coal place across our street, and there were braziers outside many of the good cafes so that you could keep warm on the terraces. Our own apartment was warm and cheerful. We burned boulet, which were molded egg-shaped lumps of coal dust, on the wood fire, and on the streets the winter light was beautiful. Now you were accustomed to see the bare trees against the sky, and you walked on the fresh-washed gravel paths through the Luxembourg gardens in the clear, sharp wind. The trees were beautiful without their leaves, when you were reconciled to them, and the winter winds blew across the surfaces of the ponds and the fountains were blowing in the bright light. All the distances were short now since we had been in the mountains. Because of the change in altitude, I did not notice the grade of the hills except with pleasure, and the climb up to the top floor of the hotel where I worked, in a room that looked across all the roofs and the chimneys of the high hill of the quarter, was a pleasure. The fireplace drew well in the room, and it was warm and pleasant to work. I brought mandarin and roasted chestnuts to the room in paper packets and peeled and ate the small tangerine-like oranges, and threw their skins and spat their seeds in the fire when I ate them, and roasted chestnuts when I was hungry. I was always hungry with the walking and the cold and the working. Up in the room I had a bottle of kirsch that we had brought back from the mountains, and I took a drink of kirsch when I would get toward the end of a story or toward the end of the day's work. When I was through working for the day, I put the notebook or the paper away in the drawer of the table and put any mandarin that were left in my pocket. They would freeze if they were left in the room at night. It was wonderful to walk down the long flights of stairs knowing that I'd had good luck working. I always worked until I had something done, and I always stopped when I knew what was going to happen next. That way I could be sure of going on the next day. But sometimes, when I was starting a new story and I could not get it going, I would sit in front of the fire and squeeze the peel of the little oranges into the edge of the flame and watch the sputter of blue that they made. I would stand and look out over the roofs of Paris and think, Do not worry. You have always written before, and you will write now. All you have to do is write one true sentence. Write the truest sentence that you know. So finally, I would write one true sentence, and then go on from there. It was easy then, because there was always one true sentence that you knew or had seen or had heard someone say. If I started to write elaborately, or like someone introducing or presenting something, I found that I could cut that scroll work or ornament out and throw it away and start with the first true, simple, declarative sentence I had written. Up in that room, I decided that I would write one story about each thing that I knew about. I was trying to do this all the time I was writing, and it was good and severe discipline. It was in that room, too, that I learned not to think about anything that I was writing from the time I stopped writing until I started again the next day. That way my subconscious would be working on it, and at the same time I would be listening to other people and noticing everything, I hoped. Learning, I hoped. And I would read so that I would not think about my work and make myself impotent to do it. Going down the stairs when you had worked well, and that needed luck as well as discipline, was a wonderful feeling, and I was free then to walk anywhere in Paris. If I walked down by different streets to the Jardin du Luxembourg in the afternoon, I could walk through the gardens and then go to the Musée du Luxembourg, where the great paintings were that have now mostly been transferred to the Louvre and the Jeux de Pomme. I went there nearly every day for the Cezannes and to see the Manets and the Monets and the other Impressionists that I had first come to know about in the Art Institute at Chicago. I was learning something from the painting of Cezanne that made writing simple, true sentences far from enough to make the stories have the dimensions that I was trying to put in them. I was learning very much from him, but I was not articulate enough to explain it to anyone. Besides, it was a secret. 
But if the light was gone in the Luxembourg, I would walk up through the gardens and stop in at the studio apartment where Gertrude Stein lived at 27 Rue de Fleurus. My wife and I had called on Miss Stein, and she and the friend who lived with her had been very cordial and friendly, and we had loved the big studio with the great paintings. It was like one of the best rooms in the finest museum, except there was a big fireplace, and it was warm and comfortable, and they gave you good things to eat and tea and natural distilled liqueurs made from purple plums, yellow plums, or wild raspberries. These were fragrant, colorless alcohols served from cut glass carafes in small glasses, and whether they were quetch, mirabelle, or framboise, they all tasted like the fruits they came from converted into a controlled fire on your tongue that warmed you and loosened your tongue. Miss Stein was very big, but not tall, and was heavily built like a peasant woman. She had beautiful eyes and a strong German-Jewish face that also could have been Friolano, and she reminded me of a northern Italian peasant woman with her clothes, her mobile face, and her lovely, thick, alive immigrant hair which she wore put up in the same way she had probably worn it in college. She talked all the time, and at first it was about people and places. Her companion had a very pleasant voice, was small, very dark, with her hair cut like Joan of Arc in the Boutte de Montveil illustrations and had a very hooked nose. She was working on a piece of needlepoint when we first met them, and she worked on this and saw to the food and drink and talked to my wife. She made one conversation and listened to two, and often interrupted the one she was not making. Afterwards, she explained to me that she always talked to the wives. The wives, my wife and I felt, were tolerated. But we liked Miss Stein and her friend, although the friend was frightening, and the paintings and the cakes and the eau de vie were truly wonderful. They seemed to like us, too, and treated us as though we were very good, well-mannered, and promising children, and I felt that they forgave us for being in love and being married. Time would fix that. And when my wife invited them to tea, they accepted. When they came to our flat, they seemed to like us even more, but perhaps that was because the place was so small and we were much closer together. Miss Stein sat on the bed that was on the floor and asked to see the stories I had written, and she said that she liked some of them except one called Up in Michigan. It's good, she said. That's not the question at all. But it is inaccrochable. That means it is like a picture that a painter paints, and then he cannot hang it when he has a show, and nobody will buy it because they cannot hang it either. But what if it is not dirty, but it is only that you are trying to use words that people would actually use, that are the only words that can make the story come true, and that you must use them? You have to use them. But you don't get the point at all, she said. You mustn't write anything that is inaccrochable. There is no point in it. It's wrong, and it's silly. I see, I said. I did not agree at all but it was a point of view, and I did not believe in arguing with my elders. I would much rather hear them talk, and many of the things that Gertrude said were very intelligent. She told me that sooner or later I must give up journalism, and I could not have agreed with her more. She herself wanted to be published in the Atlantic Monthly, she told me, and she would be. She told me that I was not a good enough writer to be published there or in the Saturday Evening Post, but that I might be some new sort of writer in my own way but the first thing to remember was not to write stories that were inaccrochable. I did not argue about this nor try to explain again what I was trying to do about conversation. That was my own business, and it was much more interesting to listen. That afternoon, too, she told us how to buy pictures. You can either buy clothes or buy pictures, she said. It's that simple. No one who is not very rich can do both. Pay no attention to your clothes and no attention at all to the mode, and buy your clothes for comfort and durability, and you will have the clothes and money to buy pictures. But if I never bought any more clothing ever, I said, I wouldn't have enough to buy the Picassos that I want. No, he's out of your range. You have to buy the people of your own age, of your own military service group, 
You'll know them. You'll meet them around the quarter. There are always good, new, serious painters. But it's not you buying clothes so much. It's your wife always. It's women's clothes that are expensive. I saw my wife trying not to look at the strange steerage clothes that Miss Stein wore, and she was successful. When they left, we were still popular, I thought, and we were asked to come again to 27 Rue de Fleurus. It was later on that I was asked to come to the studio any time after five in the wintertime. I had met Miss Stein in the Luxembourg. I cannot remember whether she was walking her dog or not, nor whether she had a dog then. I know that I was walking myself, since we could not afford a dog nor even a cat then, and the only cats I knew were in the cafes or small restaurants or the great cats that I admired in concierge's windows. Later I often met Miss Stein with her dog in the Luxembourg Gardens, but I think this time was before she had one. But I accepted her invitation, dog or no dog, and had taken to stopping in at the studio, and she always gave me the natural eau de vie, insisting on refilling my glass, and I looked at the pictures and we talked. The pictures were wonderful, and the talk was very good. She talked, mostly, and she told me about modern pictures and about painters, more about them as people than as painters, and she talked about her work. She showed me the many volumes of manuscript that she had written and that her companion typed each day. Writing every day made her happy, but as I got to know her better, I found that for her to keep happy it was necessary for this steady daily output, which varied with her energy, but was regular and therefore became huge, to be published and that she receive official recognition. This had not become an acute situation when I first knew her, since she had published three stories that were intelligible to anyone. One of these stories, Melanctha, was very good and good samples of her experimental writing had been published in book form and had been well praised by critics who had met her or known her. She had such a personality that when she wished to win anyone over to her side, she could not be resisted. And critics who met her and saw her pictures took writing of hers that they could not understand on trust because of their enthusiasm for her as a person and their confidence in her judgment. She had also discovered many things about rhythms and the uses of words in repetition that were valid and valuable, and she talked well about them. But for her to continue to write each day without the drudgery of revision nor the obligation to make her writing intelligible and continue to have the true happiness of creation, it was beginning to become necessary for her to have publication and official acceptance, especially for the unbelievably long book called the Making of Americans. This book began magnificently, went on very well for a long way with stretches of great brilliance, and then went on endlessly in repetitions that a more conscientious and less lazy writer would have put in the wastebasket. I came to know it very well as I got Ford Maddox Ford to publish it in the Transatlantic Review serially. Forced, perhaps would be the word, knowing that it would outrun the life of the review. I was overly familiar with the review's finances, and I had to read all of Miss Stein's proof for her, as this was a work which gave her no happiness. On this cold afternoon, when I had come past the concierge's lodge and the cold courtyard to the warmth of the studio, all that was years ahead. And on this day, Miss Stein was instructing me about sex. By that time, we liked each other very much, and I had already learned some time before that everything I did not understand probably had something to it. Miss Stein thought that I was what we would probably call now a square about sex, and I must admit that I had certain prejudices against homosexuality since I knew its more primitive aspects. I knew it was why you carried a knife and would use it when you were in the company of tramps when you were a boy in the days when wolves was not a slang term for men obsessed by the pursuit of women. I knew many inaccrochable terms and phrases from Kansas City days and the mores of different parts of that city, Chicago, and the lake boats. Under questioning, I tried to tell Miss Stein that when you were a boy and moved in the company of men, you had to be prepared to kill a man, 
know how to do it, and really know that you would do it in order not to be interfered with. That was the term that was accrochable. If you knew you would kill, other people sensed it very quickly, and you were let alone. But there were certain situations you could not allow yourself to be forced into or trapped into. I could have expressed myself more vividly by using an inaccrochable phrase that wolves used on the lake boats. Oh, gash may be fine, but one eye for mine. But I was always careful of my language with Miss Stein, even when true phrases might have clarified or better expressed a prejudice. Yes, yes, Hemingway, she said, but you were living in a milieu of criminals and perverts. I did not want to argue that, although I thought that I had lived in a world such as it was, and there were all kinds of people in it, and I tried to understand them, but some of them I could not like, and some I still hated. But what about the old man, with beautiful manners and a great name, who came to the brought me hospital in Italy and brought me a bottle of Marsala or Campari and behaved perfectly, and then one day you would have to tell the nurse never to let that man into the room again, I asked. Those people are sick and cannot help themselves, and you should pity them. Should I pity so-and-so? I asked. I gave his name, but he delights so in giving it himself that I feel there is no need to give it for him. No, he's vicious. He's a corrupter, and he's truly vicious. But he's supposed to be a good writer. He's not, she said. He's just a showman, and he corrupts for the pleasure of corruption, and he leads people into other vicious practices as well. Drugs, for example. And in Milan, the man I'm to pity was not trying to corrupt me? Don't be silly. How could he hope to corrupt you? Do you corrupt a boy like you, who drinks alcohol with a bottle of Marsala? No. He was a pitiful old man who could not help what he was doing. He was sick, and he could not help it, and you should pity him. I did at the time, I said, but I was disappointed, because he had such beautiful manners. I took another sip of eau de vie and pitied the old man and looked at Picasso's nude of the girl with the basket of flowers. I had not started the conversation and thought it had become a little dangerous. There were almost never any pauses in a conversation with Miss Stein, but we had paused, and there was something she wanted to tell me, and I filled my glass. You know nothing about any of this, really, Hemingway, she said. You've met known criminals and sick people and vicious people. The main thing is that the act male homosexuals commit is ugly and repugnant, and afterwards they are disgusted with themselves. They drink, take drugs to palliate this, but they are disgusted with the act, and they are always changing partners and cannot be really happy. I see. In women, it is the opposite. They do nothing that they are disgusted by, and nothing that is repulsive, and afterwards they are happy, and they can lead happy lives together. I see, I said. But what about so-and-so? She's vicious, Miss Stein said. She's truly vicious. So she can never be happy except with new people. She corrupts people. I understand. You're sure you understand? There were so many things to understand in those days, and I was glad when we talked about something else. The park was closed, so I had to walk down along it to the Rue de Vaugirard and around the lower end of the park. It was sad when the park was closed and locked, and I was sad walking around it instead of through it, and in a hurry to get home to the Rue Cardinal Le Moine. The day had started out very brightly, too. I would have to work hard tomorrow. Work could cure almost anything, I believed then, and I believe it now. Then all I had to be cured of, I believed Miss Stein felt, was youth and loving my wife. I was not at all sad when I got home to the Rue Cardinal Le Moine and told my newly acquired knowledge to my wife. And we were happy in the night with our own knowledge we already had and other new knowledge we had acquired in the mountains.